Behind! Alrighty, and this is week 11 and a little bit of week 10 of uh, the Chargers and the Colts and the Bolts and Colts podcast. How are you doing tonight, Bri? I'm good, Bri. How are you? We are recording this the eve before Thanksgiving, which means that there are a lot of chores happening. There's a lot of stuff going on. But because we didn't get a chance to catch up last week and miraculously both of our teams won uh, you know, this past weekend, we, we had to get together and record something before this next slate of games came up. And so I really definitely want to focus on the big wins for both teams this week, but also wanted to just throw back to the week before. Now the Chargers, you know, lost again. They lost to to Tua and the Miami Dolphins in a game that they absolutely should have won and just played poorly in all phases of the game. But the Colts had a big win against the Titans. And yeah. that is a team that they are facing again this weekend. What do you think about a the fact that they that they beat the Titans in a game where the Titans coming into that game, you know, uh, I feel like were being talked about more than the Colts because you know the Colts had been a little bit inconsistent, and so they come in they get a big win against the Titans and they have to turn around and face them two weeks later. What do you think about that first win and how do you think that informs what's going to happen this weekend? I mean, I think the Colts have owned the Titans over the last few years. I mean, I think the record, I think maybe one loss in three, four or five years, maybe. So coming into the game, I, I had a feeling the Colts were going to were gonna win. But then that second half, man, that Colts D took over. Rivers looked pretty good. And then they started hitting on all cylinders. And they scored, what, two touchdowns and a field goal pretty quick. Went up by two scores and they never looked back, I think. When you're looking back at this season at the end of the year, regardless of what happens, either in the playoffs or Super Bowl, like that will be the turnaround game for the Colts. Well, and it was a game where, again, I feel like we every week the topic of conversation is uh, and I'm starting to get the whole Philip Rivers thing, because like when they win, he gets no credit. And when they lose, it's 100 percent his fault. And so this was a game where they win 34 to 17. Defense did play great. But Rivers, in that game against the Titans, 29 of 39 for 308 yards and a touchdown with no interceptions. That's a big day. He He played played great. He played great, dude. That was a big day for them. Michael Pittman in that game had 100 yards receiving. Hines had uh, five catches for 45 yards. I mean, he was spreading the ball around to everybody except for uh, T.Y. Hilton, although T.Y. had four catches in that game, which might have been a season high at that point in time. And so... Really solid game by then. And then, so now going into this week's game coming up, um, before we talk about, uh, you know, the games of this past week, do you think they're going to see anything different from the Titans here? Or is it what you see is what you get with the Titans? Listen, I think it's what you see is what you get with the Titans, you know? Tannehill, that first game looked really strong in the first half. Second half, he struggled. Um, I think when you shut down Derrick Henry and you make Tannehill beat you, you put yourself in a much better situation. And when the Colts went up, though, those two scores, you basically took you took Henry out of the game. And you made you forced Tannehill to beat you, and he couldn't do it. So I think once that Colts defense gets a lead and they're playing with the lead in the third, fourth quarter, you're you're gonna you're not gonna beat them. Like that defense is playing great. Well, and I think you just outlined it. I mean, getting up early, letting the defense be able to have more options now because they they're they're playing with a lead and even though i think in that game that henry had uh around 100 yards rushing if not 100 yards rushing but you're absolutely right it was a lot of that yardage was just not impactful because they it wasn't them setting the tone it wasn't them eating up the clock they were playing from behind for most of the game and so it definitely it, with that team, I think because they're a physical team, they will eat up the clock if you uh, if you fall behind to them. I think it's really important for the Colts this week to keep it close early, get up early, put themselves in a position to really let the defense go after Tannehill and really uh, try to shut down Henry. 
Yeah, I, that's the key to the game. You know, I don't. They're in their home. You know, I don't think the Colts are going to struggle too hard this weekend. I think last week we'll talk about it, but when Rivers came out in that second half, he was a different quarterback. You know, like Rivers played great. He he matched Rodgers' numbers, and Rodgers is always considered a MVP pick through every year. You know, and I think if you look at those game stats, Rivers probably outperformed him. I don't know what his QBR was, but for the most part. Rivers was the better quarterback that day. He didn't. Well, they each. Well, and we can jump right into that game because in that game, which I I believe was the game of the week, um, it was a phenomenal game to watch. I mean, it was it was everything you want from a football game with one of your favorite teams. And of course, the win is the icing on the cake in that situation. It would it it still would have been a great game, but it would have been a real tough loss if if they didn't win that one, but you know, they both threw. So I think, uh, Rogers had a few more yards than rivers did rivers ended up with a uh, two eighty eight, but they both threw for three touchdowns and one interception. And, but I think the interceptions were different dude, because the interception for rivers was off of a tip ball and he's had a cup. And that's the thing that bothers me. Like when I see these sort of armchair critics who, you know, will look at the stat line and be like, oh, rivers threw another interception, but those those interceptions, like I'll take those stats from him every single week, 300 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, go to town. Um, it was another game where he was moving the ball around. I mean, I'm looking at the amount of receptions these guys had. He had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven 11 different receivers that he threw to for those uh, 300 yards. Pittman, again, had a pretty good game. Uh, Hilton had three catches for 36, but he's really spreading the ball around. And he seems to be in the flow of that offense now where he he always likes to get up to the line and make a lot of adjustments and make a lot of calls and stuff like that. But the amount of plays that I saw him uh, change and make adjustments and call out you know, uh, different sets the defense was in and, and call out specific players and, and make sure like he was orchestrating in that game. And I w- it was impressive. It would, t- to me, there was a lot of vintage Phillip Rivers in that game and it, it did my heart good to see it. And you know who we haven't talked about? We haven't talked about Hines. We haven't talked about Taylor or like they ran hard. Like, Dude, Taylor they- had 22 carries for 90 yards, an average of 4.1 per carry. That was the best game I've seen him play all year. Um, I left that game pretty pretty optimistic that we can compete with anyone in the AFC this year, including the Steelers, who I know are undefeated. But listen, they're sloppy. They don't have a lot of superstars on their team. They got Ben, but he's old. Like they're they're squeaking games out. There's no one in the AFC that I'm really that scared of. No, and the thing about this game that I think is super impressive, number one, it's against the Packers, who are a very good team. They had just beaten a good Tennessee team the week before. But this was a game, unlike the other one, where they played from behind a lot of this game. And the fact that they, I mean, they were down 28-14 at one point. The fact that they kept punching. This was a heavyweight fight. And to see... You knew the defense was going to throw punches, right? But you also knew that, like, you're not going to stop Aaron Rodgers. You're not going to shut down Aaron Rodgers. I thought they played well against him, even though they, you know, they they gave up touchdowns. So it didn't maybe on paper look like they played that well. But I thought that they, you know, they did a decent job against him. It's just you're not going to stop that team completely. And I think in the second half is when they really – really kind of found their form. Um, was three points they gave up, right? In that whole three points half. in the second half, dude. And so that was super encouraging and a come from behind win. Now, granted the end of the game got a little bit wonky. I was not a fan of the play calling towards the end of the game. I feel like that was, uh, they could have taken care of that game in regulation. That game did not need to go to overtime and they're lucky that they got the fumble in overtime and were able to then just win the game because you don't, you don't want to put yourself in an overtime situation against Aaron Rodgers. You know, you don't want to put yourself in an overtime situation against Tom Brady, right? There's like, you just don't want to be another chapter in that story. Granted, Phillip has had plenty of come from behind wins and overtime wins in his career as well. But often he's on the receiving end of 
that kind of thing in those in those games and or at least the teams that I like and it's been the Chargers for years are on the wrong end of those uh, outcomes in that situation. So to see them win that game, uh, Blankenship, I mean, how do you not love that kid? He's <laughs> right, just, and uh, the punter, their special teams are crushing it, man. Like, uh, yeah, absolutely, dude, crushing it. And this defense reminds me. You probably don't remember. You might remember, but like with Freeney, Mathis on the ends rushing in. You had Brackett, Bob Sanders. Like that defense was pretty good, but this defense is better. I think this defense is the number one rated defense in the league. If Rivers can just stop with the turnovers, which he did against Green Bay, which he get, which, yep. which he did against Tennessee, like the Colts have just as good a shot as anybody to win this thing. And it's it's pretty exciting to say that because I have been a pretty hard critic on Rivers. And obviously, when you get older, your arm gets weaker. He, his arm is not as strong as it was. But I, I do agree with you, Brian. I think people give him way too much shit for the losses. And he played his ass off last week. Well, like, and, I, and to me, dude, like his fatal flaw is the turnovers, right? But I also feel like because of the years of trauma that he suffered in San Diego and Los Angeles, he was frequently put in a situation where he had to win the game with his arm. Yes. And so it is just part of his DNA. It, you know, it's it's that Jake the Snake dude. It, it, it's the it's that mentality of like I got to put this team on my back. I got to make a bleak, big play right here. This is a clutch moment. If I don't do it now, we're not going to win this game. And I think what hopefully he's seeing now, and I hope it holds true for the rest of the season, is that he has a great defense. He's got plenty of people around him. Not that he didn't have weapons in in uh, you know L.A. and San Diego, but specifically from a defensive standpoint. Like so, he can he doesn't have to win the game on one play. Right. And, you know, if he can just stay away from that kind of stuff. And I was a little bit worried because here is a game where they're down for a lot of the game. Right. And they're down multiple scores at times in this game. And so I kept kind of waiting for maybe one of those gunslinger moments. And to be honest, when he stepped up into the pocket and took some of those huge hits. I mean, there he was one pounded. where I thought he had broken ribs when it, when he, he when got he got absolutely hammered. Yep. Uh, you know, he went to the tent because he, his foot was messed up. And, and the thing about it is with the consecutive games that he has started, the amount of injuries that Philip Rivers has weathered in his career that we'll never know about is immeasurable. And he's a gamer, dude. And he was right back out there you know, as soon as he could be. And so I just felt like this was a game where he was a veteran leader. He made big plays when he had to. He had commanded that offense for the whole game. He was changing a lot of stuff at the line. He spread the ball around. And that's what he, when he's playing like that, he's going to be successful. And so that was just a great game to watch. I mean, that that whole game, I was yelling at the TV. It was on TV. I got to actually watch it here, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, yelling at the TV, hooting and hollering, just like so pumped to see not just Rivers playing great, but how many guys on offense were getting involved. And then on defense, like physical, really physical stuff, which I think that's the head of steam they want to take into this game this week because Tennessee is a physical team. They're a physical offensive team in terms of running the ball and they're a physical defensive team. And I think, you know, the Colts are really starting to kind of feel that physicality that it, they're, they're starting to, it, it almost feels like this defense now is running downhill yeah. and that is exciting to watch because guys are, there's just a momentum to what's happening now. And it's exciting to watch, man. And I, and I hope it carries into this week because this is, you know, if they, if they can win this week and have those three games, Tennessee, Green Bay, and Tennessee again, whew, that is just putting them in a real good shape for the postseason. I mean, they're already in, in, in good shape for, you know, a potential playoff spot. But, man, a win this week would just be absolutely huge. So I just hope that they can keep that momentum up. I hope there's no letdown after a big win against Green Bay um, because th this team can do some damage in the playoffs. If, if if we can get to the playoffs healthy and get to the playoffs with some good momentum, like I wouldn't want to play Indianapolis in the nope. playoffs. That's Neither for would I. Sure. And it doesn't matter where you play them. These guys, they can, they can 
throw they can run, and they're going to come out, and they're just going to punch you in the face. It doesn't matter what style of offense you run. That defense is coming out to fight, and I love this team. I think I was a little hard on Rivers in the beginning, so I'm going to apologize. I publicly apologize to Rivers. Well, he'll make you furious again before the end of the season, yeah, buddy. So you will. can like you don't have to apologize too much. But I do. What I love about Rivers and and anyone who's watching for any length of time, like especially all of us, you know, Chargers fans over the years, like. I can't think of another guy who loves to play football as much as Philip Rivers. He no, is just a freaking competitor. And he's he's playing – I mean you said it a couple of weeks ago. You look at his arm now and things like that. Like he's playing on willpower now <laughs> and like and making it happen, which is really freaking exciting. So uh, that's just a huge win. Like this maybe have been – this was probably my favorite game of the season so far. That 100%. I've this was his biggest win. He 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 carried that team. Like, he carried it. I know the defense chunk Green Bay down like they did what they're supposed to do, but I do think this was the best I've seen Rivers play. He was accurate. He made the right reads. He made the right throws. Um, yeah, I mean, and, he, and he's giving the ball, like you said earlier, he's spreading it around to all of his playmakers. You know, T.Y. Hilton's not really playing good football, and we, we've talked about this all year. But Harris is playing great football. Mo Ali Cox is playing great football. Pittman, best game of the year. I think he takes off. I think if you have him on your fantasy teams, you start him. Rivers has all the confidence in the world in him right now. Yep. So he's going to feed Pittman. Um, Pittman looks really good, Bri. I think uh, this Colts team, it's going to be interesting. I think they come out, and I, I think they're going to beat the shit out of Tennessee again. I do. They're home, coming off a high. They know they well, can it, play it, with anyone and, right now. And this is a like, statement game. This feels to me, and I'm, I'm just glad for everybody involved in it, because it feels to me like Rivers is the right quarterback for this team right now. Yep. We know that this team is going to need a franchise quarterback, uh, whether they pick one up in the draft this year or they, they sign somebody or whatever. Like Rivers is not the long-term solution there. He's a two-year at best you know, solution in this situation, but he's a veteran. He's a gamer. He's ultra-competitive. And he's helping this offense build an identity and build confidence. And you're starting to see that with some of these young guys. And they just have a ton of young talent on this team that if that's already in place when the franchise quarterback comes in to this situation and you've got a stellar defense and your special teams are solid too, like – Man, the Colts have a real big upside over the next few years for sure. And and I just but I feel like right now this was a great situation for Rivers and this is a great situation for the Colts. And I just hope that it plays out that way for the rest of the season and he gets some playoff action with this team and they make some noise in the playoffs because I think that would be that would be really great to see. Um one team that is not going to be making the playoffs is the Los Angeles Chargers. I know, I'm sorry. Now, man. They faced off against the O and nine New York Jets, and they almost left town losing to the one and nine New York Jets. I know. Chargers pulled out a thirty four to twenty eight victory in another second half defensive collapse from a team like they they escaped with their lives uh, in this game which is really a shame because damned if justin herbert didn't come out and look amazing again huge huge day from him huge day from keenan allen keenan allen 16 catches for 145 yards and a touchdown he he is automatic dude he is just freaking automatic Mike Williams, four catches, 72 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Hunter Henry, four catches, 48 yards, and a touchdown. And then he spread the ball around to seven or eight more guys after that. Just superb by Herbert. I don't know if you saw the highlight of the touchdown throw that he made to Keenan Allen when he rolled to his left and basically threw across his body to Keenan Allen, who was going towards the corner of the end zone, basically stopped and cut back in the other direction. Herbert had already thrown the ball, and he threw it with such a velocity 
that even though the defensive back was right there, he had no shot of catching that ball. Did you see that throw? Did I, listen, you see I did highlight? not see that. All honesty, I did not Good see God. that throw. But we talked earlier how big of an arm he has. The kid can play. I think when you're, when you're looking at both of our teams, obviously you are a Chargers guy first, Colts guy second, and I am a Colts guy first. You have potentially front running right now. You have the offensive rookie of the year on the Chargers and Herbert, and then you have the defensive rookie of the year on the Colts and Blackman. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, Herbert just got another like FedEx offensive player of the week or whatever. Like he, he was just freaking amazing. And now he had had a mediocre game. I think uh, to me, the worst game that he played all season was the week before when they lost to Miami. The whole team just looked very flat to me and didn't, uh, didn't have it together. Freaking Herbert in this game, dude, like he was, he was just on fire and it was a good thing that he was because the Chargers start the game getting a punt blocked. Uh, and then the Jets score a touchdown immediately. This yep. they have the worst. In fact, I just read today that their special teams coach was basically demoted and put into a different role. And like the one of the assistant guys is now taking over special teams. Their special teams are awful. Their punt unit is absolutely awful. They're giving up, I think, the most return yards per average in the league. They're missing field goals, getting punt blocked like poor field position, atrocious. And then the defense, again, in the second half, just, you know, giving up way too much. I mean, they're up 24 to 6 going into the third quarter. The game was 34-28. Like, the second you just talked about a few minutes ago, the fact that the Colts gave up three points in the second half against Green Bay, one of the better teams in the NFL. The Chargers gave up three touchdowns in the second half to the worst team in the league. (laughs) Just like unbelievable, dude. Um, And they basically gave up a safety at the end of the game in order to just preserve, to run out the clock and, and preserve, uh, you know, not giving the ball back to the Jets and, and giving them any time to do anything with it because they're so inept on defense in the second half that they just couldn't fathom having to actually stop the Jets uh, in the second half. I, I just don't know. I mean, at this point in the season, it's not a conditioning thing. I know that half of it's their— It's a coaching thing, right? I'm sorry to interrupt. It's coaching. Yeah, I agree. Because— As an outsider looking at your team, the Chargers, they're really good. Like, I know Herbert's a rookie, but rookie quarterbacks, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, like rookie quarterbacks aren't the same. Like that whole stigma about, oh, rookie quarterbacks. Well, rookie quarterbacks never used to throw for 400 yards and three or four touchdowns a game like Herbert does. So I'm kind of over the whole rookie quarterback shit. When you look roster talent-wise up and down, Chargers can compete with the Colts. It's their coaching staff. There's got to be some sort of breakdown, right? And as an outsider, that head coach has to go. His whole staff has to go. I know, you dude. Have a, it... You have a potentially strong Super Bowl contender team. You've got that defense led by Bosa. Like, you're going to lose your best players if you don't get this straightened out and straightened out quick. This is a classic example of a team, and especially on defense, that is full of great players, but is a terrible defensive unit as a team yeah and that is to me yeah that to me is a coaching problem they don't blitz they don't generate enough pressure on the quarterback the fact that they have superhumans on you know with ingram and bosa putting pressure on the quarterback are the only reasons that they generate any results from you know from that is because they have tremendous athletes but that's the problem is it's all individual athletes making plays whereas I watch the Colts defense play, and it is a unit. It is a defensive scheme. It is adjustments made at halftime where you come out as a Colts team and give up three points in the second half because you've made adjustments. The Chargers make no adjustments, and in the second half, the other team who has made adjustments at halftime comes out and steamrolls them. And Herbert finds himself in a shootout every game, but because of the awful offensive play calling, he is constantly in third down situations. That's my one uh, criticism as well of the Colts. I still feel like 
a lot of the play calling for the Colts is so vanilla and so conservative on first and second down that you're constantly asking the team to pick up third and long. And I just feel like if they could clean that one thing up, if they could just clean that one thing up, their offense would be even more efficient. Rivers would be less likely to gunsling because he wouldn't be sitting in third and long. I feel like they could use play action so much more. I, I feel like they almost do no play action on, I know. on the well, course, which can't, blows me can't away. Really with, he, bro, he's so slow. Like I, I was now thinking the do, same thing, but he is slow, dude. So like you're play actioning and you're going to, you're faking the handoff to Taylor or, or Hines. You don't have, he just doesn't have the foot speed anymore to do that. And I think that's why they don't do it. That's just me looking at, at that offense, because I was always wondering the same thing, Brad, like you got to get more, you got to get more play action, but can you imagine if they had a mobile quarterback, how disgusting this offense would be? Like the play action would be, would be killer. Yeah. Because right now what they're doing is basically running short yardage plays on first and second down, and then hoping that they have five or less to pick up on third down. And they've been pretty efficient in picking them up and they've, because they're not a, a real, huge play offense although you know rivers is good for a couple of of, uh decent you know mid-range throws a few times a game but they're they're grinding you know they're they're eating up uh chunks of yards at a time but small chunks and that's just where he's at in his career now and that's you know what that offense looks like whereas over on the you know charger side you've got herbert who can throw you know a five yard out or he can throw a 60 yard bomb and and he'll do both uh, over the but but also he is also getting put in a situation where they are running into the line two plays in a row and he's in third and long. It just so happens that the kid is, you know, 20 years younger than Rivers and, right. you know, and has a freaking cannon for an arm and is super accurate. And so he's making plays that he shouldn't have to make because the coaching is putting him in a bad situation. And I agree with you. I, I'm, I at this point in the season, I can't make any apologies for the coaching staff, you know, the fact that Anthony Lynn did not fire his special teams coach, but instead like reassigned him to me is very disappointing. So let me, let me ask you this, Brian, again, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like, I kind of get heated because these are easy fixes. So if you're the GM of the chargers, what do you do with Lynn at the end of the season? Well, they're going to let him go, but I think, uh, actually I will be shocked if they don't let him go. But what I, struggle with with the chargers they don't like to do stuff in the middle of the season now if he goes out and has another real embarrassing loss could they make a change before the end of the season possibly but they're an after the season type of team so for the most part i would say if they continue to be uh fun to watch but not ultimately winning games lynn is going to be gone at the end of the year in fact I think the only thing that could save them now is if they won out for the rest of the year yeah, and, and, and ended up with a winning record for the season. Cause I think they have seven losses right now. So if they won out for the rest of the year and they uh, they're not going to make the playoffs, but if they end the season on a big up note and he's getting Eckler back this week, it looks like, so that'll be really good for the running game. But when you look at what this team could have achieved this year, especially with Herbert at the helm offensively, and you look at where they are, it's it, it, it's a catastrophically disappointing season to this point. And yeah. so I just don't see how they can justify keeping Lynn. And I don't know what the answer is for them. Like, I think they're going to uh, – they haven't been the team to go out and get the flashy head coach – with the pedigree, you know, like people say, oh, they should get Belichick. They're, they they don't get the Belichicks. They don't do that. Like they'll hire a coordinator, you know, or they'll hire someone who was a former head coach but now is a coordinator for somebody else. Like, you know, when they hired Norv Turner, that was like a big name for them because outside of that, you got guys like Mike McCoy, you know, that they, Anthony Lynn, you know, you, you got guys like uh, – God, Mike Riley, who, you know, who and went on to coach Oregon State for a while after after he was with the Chargers. Like they're they're just not like a marquee name. The biggest name they had was Marty Schottenheimer. And this team has never been as well coached as it was when Marty Schottenheimer was coaching them. 
and he was and that let was go during after a, that was during Rivers um like prime right when they it had was Sean during Reimer. his early years absolutely and he was let go after a 14 and 2 season because they lost in the playoffs and he didn't get along with the general manager AJ Smith at the time and so they got rid of him which was the biggest mistake I think in franchise history next to moving the team to Los Angeles um, but certainly from a coaching standpoint, the biggest mistake that they've ever made. And so they've never recovered from that. They've never had a coach, the the pedigree of Marty Schottenheimer since he was there. Um, well, you know, and, well, and they, before yeah. him, Bobby Ross, who took him to the Super Bowl, right? And and when Bobby Beathard was the GM of the Chargers at that point, but but that was when they had a strong front office, and that was when they had a strong you know coaching staff, and now. It's it's like a place where guys come to audition for other jobs, you know, or to, you know, see if they or take a flyer on somebody and see if they can and they can, you know, do something with the team. And I'm really disappointed because I like Anthony Lynn and I thought this year was going to be a big step forward for them. And I was excited for him getting Herbert because I was like, man, he's going to have a good, you know, a good young quarterback now. He gets a fresh start. Obviously, he came in late in Philip Rivers' career. Philip Rivers was not, it wasn't his guy. You know, he didn't bring in Philip Rivers. He gets to start over with a new quarterback. And the fact that they're where they're at right now is just uh, so disappointing. So I just can't imagine that he's going to be there at the end of the year. But I also, I don't even know who'd be available and who would want to come in here and coach this team. I, I mean, I think because of the talent, there's going to be people that, that are going to want to come in and coach the team, but they need someone who is, who can bring structure to the entire organization. And that is a tall order, dude. I agree. Um, and I think if you continue down, down this path with, with Anthony Lynn, you're going to ruin Herbert. So I have two oh, things. Sure. I have that statement, <clears throat> excuse me, because I think when, Rivers was at his was in his prime. He had some really strong coaches behind him, guys that knew offense, guys that knew the NFL. They kind of nurtured him along. They're gonna they're gonna ruin this kid, just like the Bengals ruined Joe Burrow. I'm sorry, they should not have even been playing him. Franchise quarterback, you're in week eight, no chance of the playoffs. You're yep. getting you're getting your quarterback killed week in and week out. It sounds exactly like Andrew Luck, Bry. Yep. Andrew Luck. Obviously, he didn't have that big career-ending injury like like Burrow just had. Burrow is in trouble. Like, he got the shit kicked out of him. That GM, that coach, probably should be fired just for that reason alone, for leaving him in there to take his abuse he took all year. And it, and you saw what happened. Like, that was bound to happen. I've watched some Bengals games because I love Joe Burrow. Great player. But I was like, this kid's going to get killed. He's getting killed. Week in and week out. And then last week, boom, knees gone. I was like, I saw that. You saw that coming a mile I know, dude. away. Rookie season too. It that that's so freaking brutal. And and uh I thought about Andrew Luck, you know, kind of watching that because, you know, anything can happen once, right? Any any season can be sort of a bad season. What you saw with Luck was just a pattern of not protecting him, right? And so the response from the Bengals needs to be in this offseason that they go into next season with one of the strongest offensive lines in the league and that they go into next season. Yep. That they go into next season with a scheme that is built around protecting their franchise quarterback. Who's going to be there, you know, hopefully for his entire career. And it's the same for the chargers, dude. A healthy Andrew luck with this line. Unbelievable, dude. Like, and that's the thing, like Andrew luck had a good career in the NFL, but Andrew luck could have had a great career. Hall of Fame NFL. career if he if he stayed healthy and he and he stayed with it. Listen, I I I still don't think we've seen the last of Andrew Luck. I do believe he will play football again, whether it is with the Colts or with someone else. I I don't think he's done for good. That's just a feeling I have. Well, hey, if Rivers decides to hang it up after the end of this year, I know that's what maybe I'm he comes back for a year to mentor the new quarterback or something like that. Who's who's to say? But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, talking about the Bengals, same thing for the Chargers, dude. If their if their major uh, project this off season is not building an offensive line that is worthy of this franchise quarterback, to me that then then this organization is completely broken. Like I don't. Yep. I don't know how you – and I've always thought this, and I always felt like uh, Bill Parcells was a guy who understood that you have nothing 
if you don't have an offensive line. And I would put Belichick in there as well, because obviously uh, building an offensive line around Brady is one of the things that allowed him to be so productive over the years. And then in addition to building an offensive line, they built an offense that was predicated on getting the ball out quickly. So yep. it protected Brady. That's why Brady's had such a long career. And and he should be super thankful for that because the, the people around him knew enough to put those pieces in place to maximize his potential for success. And it's shocking to me how many teams don't do that because it's not sexy to spend money or spend picks on offensive linemen. And as a right. former offensive lineman, obviously that that annoys the shit out of me. But it really is – it just blows me away that there's not an understanding. And I would say the same thing for the defensive line. If you're not getting pressure up front, it doesn't matter how good your corners are. It doesn't matter how good your linebackers are. If you do not get pressure up front, your defense is going to struggle. On the offensive side, if you do not have an offensive line that can protect the quarterback and can run block, your offense is not going anywhere. The the linemen are – so undervalued it just blows me away and the teams that invest you see the results play out every week and so yes. like i don't understand like that so absolutely the the chargers will be uh lucky to get through this season um hopefully with herbert with the offensive line that they have right now and they need to continue to build that line in the off season you know it doesn't help that they're all pro centers out for the year it doesn't help that they've had multiple injuries on the line because they did make some moves to to address that line in the offseason. But it's got to be deeper. It's got to be better. Like you have to – you can't play around with that. Like it's it, so – there's just a lot of work to be done there. And um, I'm just thankful that we're getting to see him play and excel on a weekly basis and he's getting this experience because if they do come into next year with a good coaching staff, a better offensive line and people healthy, this team on paper, I mean, you saw it before the year started, there was talk of Super Bowl contention. Yeah. There was talk of, uh, you know, giving the chiefs a run for their money. Um, there was almost a, it was almost a given that they were going to make the playoffs this year. People were sure that they were going to make the playoffs this year. And so here we are. In all likelihood, they're going to end up with a losing record for this season. So it's just uh, it's just wild how this season has turned out so far. But, um, you know, there's still time for them to finish with a win- winning record, but they have to win out. And I don't know if that's going to happen. Because they have the Chiefs one more time, right? They do. And who do we have this week? Let's look at the matchups for this week. So we already talked about how the Colts Titans, the Chargers are playing the seven and three Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. And uh, that's going to be a tough game, man. Diggs is having a big year. Uh, in fact, I just read a stat that said Keenan Allen and uh, Stefan Diggs rank first and second in receptions this season. So on paper, this game is going to be it, it's just going to be an air show. Like, Absolutely. There's gonna be, you know, this tough, game, man, at home, Brian, it's going to be a tough game for the Chargers to win that game. Yeah, because you know the the Bills Mafia, what, and however many people they're allowing in the stands or not allowing in the stands, like the Bills Mafia is ever present. And, yes. you know, uh, that's one of the things I actually really love about that franchise is how passionate their fans are, even through decades of mediocrity. And, uh, but the Bills are not mediocre anymore. Seven and three and looking good this year. Um, it's going to be a tough one for the Chargers. But then again, all the Chargers losses are by one score. So it doesn't matter who they play. They're going to be in it. It's just right. a matter of can they pull it out? And that would be a big momentum builder for them if they were able to go to Buffalo and come out of there with a win. Um against a hot bills team. So it'll be interesting. And, it, but man, that Titans and, and Colts game, I don't know if I'm going to be able to watch it here. I don't think it's on here, but that's going to be just, uh, two heavyweight fighters punching each other in the mouth for four quarters. I know, man, it's going to be exciting. I still think the Colts take it. They're going to, they're going to come out and they're going to prove they, they, they're the best team in the AFC South. So it should be a fun weekend and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. 
Yeah, and before we wrap up, I mean, obviously we're talking about the Thanksgiving Day games that are that are coming out tomorrow. So let's run through them uh, really quickly. We have the uh, Houston and Detroit is the early game. Houston's three and seven. Detroit is four and six. Uh, what do you think for that game? I think I think the Texans win pretty easily. Yep. I agree with you there. And then, of course, uh, Washington and Dallas, which in years past has been a game that, you know, you might have gotten excited about. Both of these teams are three and seven <laughs> heading into <laughs> heading right. into tomorrow. What do you think about that? The only thing I care about in that game is Alex Smith just staying healthy. I don't want that guy to get another leg injury because I think he played a great game last week. I think the Cowboys are too tough. You know, they got Dalton back. They got Zeke back. Like Cowboys had some really bad luck this year, but I think the Cowboys tomorrow are going to come out and they'll beat they'll beat Washington pretty easily, too. Yep, I agree with that as well. So uh, and there's no night game tomorrow night. Two games, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah, just two. Um, but anyways, I mean, football on Thanksgiving is is uh, a nice way to spend the afternoon. So I'll be looking forward to that. And I am really looking forward to seeing what our teams do this weekend. So as we sign off, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving, sir. And uh, hopefully we'll be catching up next week when both of our teams have won again, which is always nice. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too, Brian. It was, uh, it was a good one today. All right, bud.